2020 is about to end. Some of you may be praying for it, it that it cannot end fast enough because it definitely have been a year of testing. Um, but the thing that I'm excited about, even though we have been tested, I'm, I look at it as preparation. I believe that God always prepares you before he places you. The things that he has been putting on my heart and, and I've been sharing with you uh, is connected to God preparing you for some form of increase. Throughout this season of 2020, in regards to what has been going on, almost for the whole year, we've been talking about first fruit offerings. And we, we look at first fruit, we're talking about the fact of increase. There's some type of increase that God wants to get done in the earth, and he uses the principle of first fruit offering to get it done. I believe that first fruit deals with things, stuff, uh, whether it be, it could be monetarily, um, it can be events uh, like a wedding night, just first fruit, just anytime you're going to another level, God's going to require first fruit. So if God is telling you that he has made you a first fruit offering, I believe it's connected to the fact that God wants to constantly elevate you. He wants to constantly keep increasing you, spiritual, relationally, and financially. Well, in order for those increases to take place, we got to understand there's going to be trials. There's going to be tribulations. There's going to be situations. There are going to be circumstances. So I want to put inside of your heart that we get away from the mindset of a woe me attitude and, and, and be more appreciative that God has chosen you to do something that maybe no one in your bloodline has taken the initiative to do. Now, he's going to increase your life. There's going to be some great moments and there's going to be some challenging moments. But in all things, no matter of the responsibility, thank God that he chose you to do the things that you have been assigned to do. We've been using David as our backdrop on Sundays and looking at the life of David, how God took David from uh, the pastor and took him to the palace. And, and now David is in his kingship. And David represents us from the standpoint that there was nothing so great about him. He was just an average guy, but he surrendered his heart to God, and God put his supernatural on David's natural. And so we, as we continue looking at 2 Samuel chapter 14, and if you're following us today, just turn to 2 Samuel chapter 14. I want you to get your pen and paper out. Let somebody know that we're on. Go ahead and share. If you're on Covenant Promises, share on your page uh, and make it a watch. And, and if you're on YouTube, share it with someone and let them know that we're on and that God is speaking today. And so we've been dealing with first fruit, but I want to entitle this today, Bitterness Reigns. Bitterness reigns. I, w I also want to prepare your hearts, guys, that, that throughout the rest of this year, based upon the things that he's showing me, he's, God is going to reveal to us how to come against and recognize the activities of demonic acti activities in our life. And so, in other words, we're going to explain spirits at times. We're going to talk about their characteristics. We're going to talk about their agenda. And so, as you're called to be a first fruit offering, one of the things that, that I want to equip you with it's the fact that you cannot initiate change until there's some type of engaging. And so what I want you to begin to set your heart, not just throughout the rest of this year, but I want this to become who you are. I want you to live a life in dominion whereby when it's time to attack demonic influences, whether it be something that's in your life personally or in the life of someone that God sends you to, that you will have the authority necessary and not trying to contra up the anointing when the anointing of God is already resting in you and flowing through you. And so I want you to be that agent of change that when God puts you in an environment and the first environment that we've been assigned to look at this year is your family. Whether you like your family, whether you wish you was born in another family, I one of the things I want you to understand, the fact that you was born in that family, you have begun the grace to get that family to a place that they cannot get to without the anointing that's on your life. So I want you to recognize this, and I want you to walk in that authority. I want you to be the woman of God, the man of God that God has called you to be, not just simply for a reputation standpoint, but you have authority in the spirit realm. I'm, I'm talking about you're able to shift things in the spirit. When you pray, things manifest, things happen. When you come against demonic activity, th things shift and move. Why? Because of your authority in the spirit realm. And so starting today, and one of the things that we're going to deal with is this root called bitterness. And, and here's what God has been showing me. In order for you to be effective in dealing with this demon, it cannot reign in your life. And what you're going to find out in all of our lives in some form or fashion, there is some type of bitterness. And I'm going to show you how bitterness comes from rejection. So last week, I talked about uh, Absalom, you remember we, we shared about him, that Absalom, sister Tamar, was raped by her brother Amnon, 
and David didn't do anything about it. Absalom for two years plotted, and eventually he ends up killing Amnon, and now he takes off running uh, for a total of uh, three years that he hid in Gersha. He hid uh, because he was afraid that David was going to kill him. So by the time we get to chapter 14, the story picks back up in the relationship of David, uh, Joab, and, and, and Absalom. And so the thing that we're going to see that there was some bitterness inside of Absalom's uh, heart. Remember we talked about that bitterness uh, comes from, uh, proceeds from rejection. I'm going to go more into detail on that. And, but, I, but I'm saying this from this perspective to get you to start writing this down because you are you going to be called over this next season to confront the spirit of bitterness. You got to confront bitterness and you got to confront rejection. So I'm giving you some keys on what you need to look for that as you start praying for God to deliver, you're, you're calling out the right confrontation. You're confronting the enemy because you, you he's being exposed and we're recognizing the, the track that the enemy is playing. So as you're preparing your heart in 2 Samuel chapter 14, uh, it says in verse 1, and, and now Joab, the son of Zerah, perceived that the king's heart was toward Absalom. Remember, Absalom was gone for three years, and Joab, who was close with Absalom, perceived that the king's heart was toward Absalom. And so Joab sent to, to, uh, to Koah and fetched thence a wise woman and said unto her, I pray thee, for in thyself to be a mourner. In other words, act like you, you went through this. Uh, this situation and put on now morning apparel and anoint not thyself with oil, but be as a woman that had a long time mourning for the dead and come to the king and speak on this manner unto him. So Joab put the words in her mouth. So uh, we see that in, 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 as we're in, embarking upon this chapter, Joab is trying to uh, get King David to allow Absalom back in. So as you're preparing yourself, let's, let's go, <coughs> excuse me, go ahead and pray. Father, we bless you and we thank you for your grace today. We thank you that your, your spirit will speak expressively. We break down every wall of the enemy right now. We come against the spirit of rejection that it no longer has dominion over the lives of your people. Father God, we come against, in the name of Jesus, spirit of bitterness right now. And we come against, Lord God, every preceding spirit that, that accompanies um, the spirit of rejection, as the spirit of rejection holds doorways for, for other demonic influences to come in and wreak havoc over people's lives. And I thank you, Lord God, that we shall expose the enemy right now. And we come against every demonic influence that's been sent on the airways, that has been sent in the ears of your people to keep them from being free. I thank you for healing and restoration and dominion in Jesus' name. Amen. So when we look at uh, in chapter 14, Joab goes to, to Koi and he gets a woman and he says, I want you to go in and I want you to tell David uh, this story about you having a son that fought against another son in the field and that son died. Now, as you remember, when, when David sinned with Bathsheba, Nathan came in and he began to talk to David uh, using uh, the story of a rich man and, and a poor man both having a flock, one having a lamb, and the rich man takes that, that lamb. I guess it got around that when you talk to David, you can get David to see things if you come at him a certain way. And so Joab now go and gets a woman. He tells her, now here's the thing that I need you to see. When Nathan was speaking to David, Nathan was speaking to David under the, the instruction of the Holy Spirit and using godly wisdom. I want you to see this. But when Joab is doing it, the thing that Joab is doing is lying to David. He's not being creative. He's lying. So in other words, Joab is trying to get a particular result from David. Watch this. But he's using lies to get it done. In other words, this is what we would call that manipulation. So let's look at what Nathan did. Let's look at what Joab did. Because this woman is going to come and have this back and forth with David as though her, she had two sons. One killed the other son. Now everybody's trying to kill her son and saying to David, do you think that this is fair? In other words, she's trying to get David to, to, to say that the son who killed the other son should be spared. And then she, she can spring on him or Joab is able to spring on him and say, okay, if you're willing to let this pass with this son, why you can't let it pass with your son? But one thing that the Holy Spirit was showing me, he said that when Nathan did it, when Nathan gave the illustration, Nathan was led by the Spirit of God. Nathan never asked anybody to lie. Nathan never used a third party. And Nathan, by the Spirit of God, was, 
shown what situation to use to get David to see the error of his ways, to get David to a place, watch this, of repentance. Joab is trying to get the same results as Nathan, but without the spirit of God. Therefore, he is using manipulation. Now, we, what we, what we want to come against, remember I told you at the beginning, during this next series, we're really going to be focusing on the money activities and how they operate. The first one we want to look at today is manipulation. Manipulation uh, is, is, is directly demonic. Manipulation tries to get you to see things a certain way to slant your judgment. That is witchcraft. Anytime you go against the will of another person, you are operating in witchcraft. So when, 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 when Joab is manipulating the situation, first he brings in a person from somewhere else. He tells her to lie. And present her before David. Now, getting David to think that there's a real situation and wanting David to judge the situation. One of the problems, as we look at manipulation, a person can, who is manipulating literally cannot see how what they're doing is going to affect everybody else. So they are blinded by their own wants and desires. What is that? That is lust. So see that that manipulation is motivated through lust. So let's expose the enemy. Manipulation is motivated through lust. Lust is concerned about self. And so here's how you can tell when, uh, that a person is motivated by um, um, manipulation because the only thing they're concerned with is getting the results that they're, they're seeking. So they, would, they don't mind. And here's another piece. I want you to cap, track this. A person who is manipulative don't mind lying or what we call a white lie just to get what they want. So Joab is using a white lie, if you would, to get what he what he want to try to trap David into saying certain things. So I want to go over this because what I what I've come to recognize in, in the Holy Spirit showing me that there's a lot of manipulating people who are actually motivated by the, by the spirit of rejection. Moving into bitterness, watch this, and here's how it comes in. When a person who manipulates don't get the, the desired results, they can eventually get bitter with the very people that they're trying to manipulate. Isn't that amazing? So a person can need money instead of coming straight out asking you for money. They don't come straight out and ask you for money because they, they fear rejection. So what they do is give, they'll create a different scenario to get what they want from you. Now, if you don't bite that scenario, they can then have their feelings hurt. Watch this. And get bitter towards you and say that you don't have any love, but they didn't come straight out. They're not going to acknowledge that they didn't come straight out and ask you for the money. They're really upset, watch this, that you did not yield to their manipulating ways because they felt if they tell you a certain way, they're going to get a, a desired response. So if you don't yield to that way that they have came up in their mind, then they can get offended, which now is going to lead, that shows rejection, which could eventually lead to bitterness. Look how this stuff works. So what I want you to do now is begin to look over your life. First, first and foremost, in order for you to be strong against these demonic spirits, they cannot be operating in you. So what I want you to do is, is look over yourself and say, man, when I want something, how do I go about trying to get it? How do I respond? Do I, am I willing to make up something just to get my way? Am I, do I present things in a certain way to get people's uh, opinion to be slanted? Uh, you see what I'm saying? And so you have to be honest and say, OK, do I come straight out and ask for what I want? Do I come straight out and talk about what I want to talk about? Or do I dance around the situation? And, it, it, and, and if you're a person that that normally dances around, I want to strongly suggest there's a strong possibility you operate in manipulation. You operate in manipulation. And so Joab, watch this, gets this woman to, to make up this lie. She, she got an audience in front of David. She's talking, and the whole time it's a lie. Because here's the thing. She was referring to her son. If her son gets restored or, or her son dies, it doesn't affect anyone. But whatever David does with Absalom affects the whole kingdom. And so the thing that you got to understand now moving to this perspective, if you're going to be a first fruit offering for your bloodline, for your family, for those that God has sent to you, you got to understand that everything that you, that you say, everything that you do is going to hold a different weight, a magnitude, because your grace of influence has increased. 
Okay, and so go let, refer back to what 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 I'm gonna what I shared on Wednesday that when what God is gonna tell Moses is that I made you a god in front of Pharaoh. In other words, not that he was literally a god, but it deals with reputation. And so what God is doing is increasing your reputation among those in whom He's gonna use you to empower. Now here's the thing you gotta understand: if you are if your influence is being is increased. There will be people who would try to ride off your said influence, even if they have to manipulate you to do what? To get you to agree, to get you to be on their side, to get you to say, say the word. So you remember what we shared on last week? Absalom went to David and said, we finna have this sheep shearing service. Dad, do you want to come? The whole time, Absalom never wanted David to come, to go. He just wanted David to bless it. And then now everybody else feel compelled to go. Why? Because David gave his decree concerning what Absalom said he wanted to do. And you got to be careful of the fact that because Absalom had never done anything like that to David before, David had his guard down. I'm not telling you to walk around suspicious. What I am telling you, there are times that you have to be cautious in giving us a, 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 your, your stamp of approval on something. Why? Because God is, is giving you a certain grace and people will try to use the grace that God has given you to a to a push their agenda and to get their way but using the spirit of discernment you need to recognize what's in operation and here's why i'm saying that so when we look at verse 18 i'm, I'm ga i gave you the backdrop just to hit you with verse 18 it says and then the king answered and said unto the woman hide not from me i pray thee the thing that i shall ask thee in other words he said i'm gonna ask you a question don't lie and the woman said let my lord the king now speak Verse 19, and the king said, is not the hand of Joab with thee in all of this discernment? Now, remember, when Amnon wanted to, to uh, get Tamar by himself, David did not discern. When Absalom wanted to get the king's son, Amnon, by himself, David did not discern. Three years uh, have went by. David has matured. He's talking to this lady, and it dawns on him, hold up, something not right with this. And he says, don't lie to me. Is Joab behind this? Look at this. And the woman answered and said, as thy soul liveth, my lord, the king, none can turn to the right hand or to the left from all that my king, the, my lord, the king, have spoken. In other words, she said, yeah, for thy servant Joab, he bade me and he put all these words in my mouth of thy handmaid. And so you have to be careful what manipulation would do. Manipulation would try to get its way and it would even rehearse to somebody else what they should do in a certain situation. Not to make the situation better, not to do what God wants to do, but what pleases their flesh. And so she says, watch this, Joab is behind this. Look, watch this. And to fetch... Uh, and to fetch about this form of speech, have thy servant Joab done this thing? In other words, to get you to say this. And, and, and my Lord is wise. She picked up the fact that he discerned what was happening according to the wisdom of an angel of God. So she gives credit to what we now know as the Holy Spirit to know all things that are in the earth. So here's another point that I need you to see. I need you to say, I need you to put inside of your heart, add this to your prayer. Holy Spirit, I need you to lead me. I need you to direct me. I need you to show me your truth. Holy Spirit, I need to be led by you. Holy Spirit, you the teacher of all things. Okay? And so now as you're trying to increase in your discerning, you need, you are, you're going to need the help of the Holy Spirit. Now, remember what we talked about last week. A counteract of that is the spirit of suspicion. Having the spirit of suspicion and walking in discernment is two separate things. Suspe and, and here's the, the, the thing. It's the state of your heart with di which dictates which side you're on. Okay? So that's why I got to make sure that my heart is at a certain place in God to make sure I'm not just a, 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 a suspicious person. A suspicious person looks for being look for opportunities of being hurt in other words they their, their mind is their eyesight is driven around being hurt being taken advantage of all these different things and so a suspicious people make great manipulators because they set the stage that everything is motivated for them not getting hurt again 
And listen to what I'm telling you. Everything is set around, set around them not being heard again because they are suspicious. And watch this. The moment that there's a chance that they need to be vulnerable, then they, they, find, they need to find some type of fault inside of the person that they are being vulnerable to. And we're going to go a lot into this as we deal with the spirit of Absalom. In other words, what typically happens or is connected to this spirit is what is known as a fault-finding spirit. In other words, a fault-finding spirit will try to find something wrong with the person. OK, even if it's a minor thing, they will hop on the minor to justify their feelings. OK, but it has nothing to do with the, the, the big picture is, but they will hop on the minor. They may say something like, well, you know, they say they're supposed to be saved, but look at the type of car that they drive. How can they be submitted to God? And, and she's wearing those kind of jeans. Minor. Has nothing to do with salvation, has nothing to do with their walk with God, but they need to find a reason of justification to justify what, what's going on inside of themselves because what the Spirit of God is really leading them to do, they find it hard to do. Why? Because they are ruled by this demonic activity and personality. And so now watch this. The king said to Joab, now this is, this is key, guys. The king said to Joab, behold, now I have done this. I have done this thing. Go, therefore, and bring the young man Absalom again. Now, this is verse 21 is so key because here's the thing. As being a manipulator, just because you get what you want doesn't mean you won. I want to say this to you. Just because you get what you want doesn't mean that you won. In other words, from this perspective, I can have my heart set on something that I want to do for you. You can, manip you can come at me from a, a manipulating perspective. I could agree with the final decision. It doesn't mean that you dupe me. It's something that I want to do anyway. Here's the, here's the problem. The problem is you think that you got away with manipulation, which in turn will cause you to do it again. Watch this. Now, if you come at me from a manipulating standpoint, I may give you your request, but I also begin to recognize the type of person you are. I recognize that you had a capacity to lie to me. I recognize that you can be manipulating. And so now, before I just take your suggestion and go with it, now I got to ask for discernment to see where it is that you're coming from. And so you got to be careful that just because you get what you want doesn't mean you're not affecting the foundation of that relationship. David had never had to worry about Joab prior to now. But now he's able to see Joab in another place. In other words, Joab will show that if it means enough to him, he's willing to try to manipulate David and get in his way. So David says, go ahead and go and get Absalom, because Joab had a special relationship with Absalom. He, he preferred him. And, and, and here's the thing. It says, and, and Joab fell on the ground, watch this, into his face and bowed himself and thanked the king. You see, you see, you see how externally he looks so, so humble? But all he's doing, and this is dealing with the spirit of manipulation, all he's doing is try to make sure that the doorway is open for him to try to do if he have another request again. He bowed himself and he thanked the king. And Joab said, Today thy servant knoweth that I have found grace in thy sight, O Lord, my king, o, uh, my, my lord, I'm sorry, O king, and that the king have fulfilled the request of thy servant. Now, here's the thing that's amazing. We see in verse 22 that, that David says, yes, he can go and get uh, in 21 and 22. Here's the point that I want to ask. Why is it we had to go through 22 verses for Joab to get what he wanted? Why is it that we could not have read in verses 1 and 2, Joab approaches the king, asks the king, can you forgive Absalom and let him come back? That's how easy that could have been. We got 20 verses of foolishness. Because Joab is trying to walk in manipulation. And here's the point that I need you to see. For those that wrestle with the fact with rejection have consumed your heart to such a degree that you, you are so afraid of the word no. The thing that you need to understand that you could waste time trying to manipulate. Just go straight to the chase. Even if I decide not to do it. Let's, at least we know where we stand. If I agree or disagree, see it different, however, let's go straight to the chase. Let's not dance around for 20 months and, and 20 years all because you're afraid that you, you may not get your way. All right. And so w the thing that, that eats away at me is the fact that all of this time that is wasted, that the king time is wasted, all that Joab had a direct line to him. Joab was a general of the army. Joab had asked for things before. But this time, because he felt as though 
David may say no. He tried to be, be manipulative. And so here's also something I need you to see. Proverbs 17 and 25 says this. A foolish son is a grief to his father and the bitterness of her who bear him, who bore him. A foolish son is a grief to his father and, the, and bitterness to her who bore him. In other words, here's what I come to recognize. And, and I use this book uh, by John Eckhart, Unshakable, where I got a lot of these notes from. And in the book, he, he makes reference to the fact that um, a child, uh, uh, children, foolish children, that, that was the title of that section, foolish children can lead to bitterness. In other words, you can have a child that acts up, a child that does all kind of stuff. And as you're interacting with that child and their rebellion, their foolishness, their foolish decision, because it may not be rebellious motivated, it, it can now hit you to a place where bitterness is consuming your heart. One of the, one of the traits of bitterness also that, that we want to look at is the fact that when you, if you're around a person and you, they don't even have to do anything and you're bothered, there's a strong possibility you're dealing with bitterness. If you, the thought of them irritates you or they walk in a room and you get irritated, they haven't even done anything. You're dealing with bitterness. And so now it's not what they have done that justifies your actions or your feelings. It is up to you and I to now respond in a, in a way to say, God, I need to be delivered because I should not feel this way. Regardless of what they did, the problem is an internal struggle. Now, Remember we talked about last week that I'm blessed, but here's what we need to recognize. Here's what I want to do. I believe that God is going to increase you externally. I'm believing that there's going to be some external changes that's going to take place in your life. But here's also what I'm believing. I'm believing that we do not disregard the greatest blessing. The greatest blessing is not the external stuff, even though those things can be great. You got to understand because the heart of man is desperately wicked, we will always deal with heart issues. We will always deal with heart issues. And since we're always going to deal with heart issues, well, well let, me, let me read this, uh, and I'm going to show you, I'm going to tie this in. Understand, we always deal with heart issues. It says, and so Joab arose, and he went to, to Gersha, and brought Absalom to Jerusalem. And the king said, let him turn to his own house, and let him not see my face. So Absalom returned to his own house and saw not the face of the king. So David says, Absalom can come back, but I don't want to see him. Absalom can come back, but I don't want to see him. Why, Pastor, why did David not want to see Absalom? Bitterness. He did not want to see Absalom because of bitterness. David had bitterness toward, his, toward Absalom because of what Absalom did to Amnon. Absalom has bitterness toward David because of what David did not do to Amnon. Look at this. David is bitter toward Absalom because of what he did to Amnon, and, and Absalom is bitter toward David because of what he didn't do. Bitterness is reigning. So that's the purpose of the title. Bitterness is reigning in David's family. David was blessed by God, anointed by God. He was a psalmist, praise and worship leader. He, he established the covenant of David, all these different things that took place. He's blessed on the outside. He's gathering money and resources for the house of God. He's conquering these outside cities. But in David's house, watch this, David is wrestling with battles. His general is revealing that he's a manipulator. His son has killed his other son. His son is bitter toward him, and he's bitter toward him. So, so now there's this internal thing that the enemy is raging. Here's what I want you to see as we deal with bitterness. When you deal with bitterness, the reason we got to address bitterness, bitterness is a direct result of rejection. So what takes place that every person in this world, some form or fashion, has faced rejection. Okay? So for those of uh, you know, I don't care what, yeah, yeah, yes, you do. In some form or fashion, you care. So we just got to find the area that you care in, all right? So everybody wrestles with rejection. But here's what the Holy Spirit revealed to me as we look at rejection. He says rejection is not the destroyer. Rejection is the gate demon. In other words, rejection gets in, and what rejection does is hold the door open for something else to come in and then cause havoc. All right. That's why we got to deal with rejection because here's the thing. Rejection is not in your face causing the problem. It's not. Rejection is the one holding the door. If you would, the rejection is the usher. The, the rejection 
usher in other demons. Now, when rejection comes in, because I want you to see this, that the core of a rebellion personality is the root of bitterness. A person can develop the root of bitterness through pain and hurt or rejection. So watch this. Now I'm dealing with rebellion. Rebellion is destroying me. But how did rebellion get there? Rebellion got there because, watch this, rejection is holding the door for re rebellion. All right. So remember, remember what we said in, in Hebrews 14, uh, uh, 12 and 15, watching diligently so that no one falls short of the grace of God. He says, you got to watch diligently so that we don't fall short of the grace of God. He gives us a key. Least any root of bitterness spring up to cause trouble and many become defiled by it. So how am I becoming defiled by it? I let rejection come in. I let the root of bitterness comes in. Watch this. Now the root of bitterness comes in and it's going to cause a whole lot of havoc. But what? how did it get here? From being rejected and the pain of rejection. Rejection, as we can write this down and let's be honest with it. Rejection hurts. Nobody want to be rejected. Rejection hurts. Okay. Now rejection hurts. Then it leads the way to, to this, this thing that we're looking at, bitterness. So now in David's life, David is reigning as king, and so is bitterness. Let's go over bitterness real quick. Real quick. The Hebrew word for bitterness is moral. And you're going to see this as on Wednesdays that we're, we're going to talk about this when the children of Israel are going to come uh, to the river more. It was a bitter river and, they, and God is going to have Moses throw a tree inside the water to make the water sweet. And that was symbolic of the fact that what sin is, that tree uh, it was symbolic of Christ and that when Christ is thrown into the thing that was bitter, he can make it sweet again. And so we see that more remains to be, to be bitter and it means to be unpleasant. Right. And figuratively, bitterness also means, guys, to rebel or resist or cause to provoke. All right. So we look at bitter change. We look at be, be disobedient, dis, disobey, grievous provocation or provoking. All right. To be to rebel, to rebel against or to be rebellious. Right. And so now here's the thing that we got to see that it is obvious. Remember, we're going to talk about spiritual warfare. It is obvious that rebellion and bitterness have the same root. Rebellion and bitterness have the same root. I'm going to give you give you a quote that says that if you stay rebellious, watch this, you will become bitter. If you stay bitter, you will be, you will become rebellious. Say that again. If you stay rebellious, you will become bitter. If you stay bitter, you will become rebellious. And this is from The Unshakable. I want to encourage you guys again to, to, to get this book, Unshakable, by John Eckhart. And I'm coming from page 82 in that book that the definition of, of, of bitterness is, is what he gives. And he actually gives this quote, if you stay rebellious, you will become bitter. And if you stay bitter, you will become rebellious. In other words, they both work hand in hand. Now, Pastor Shelley, why is this so serious? It is so serious because... If I don't deal with uh, 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 bitterness, which is going to lead to rebellion, obviously, I'm going to eventually rebel against God. So, yeah, you can rebel against people. You can rebel against authority, but you're going to eventually rebel against God. Why do you have an issue with authority? Why is it that things got to be your way? You are a rebellious person. Well, where is that coming from? You are a bitter person. You are a bitter person. So watch this. Here's the thing that you're going to understand. When you start breaking down bitterness, you're going to end up dealing with uh, rebellion. And you're going to watch. You're going to see that your personality and your ability to submit to authority is going to shift. It's going to shift. But here's another problem. Why can't you do both of those? It's because in some form or fashion, you have been rejected. You have been rejected in your life that has caused pain and hurt. And as a defense mechanism, this spirit has came into your life and it is ruling your life. And so you think it's funny to say, oh, when I get married, this is what we're going to do. I don't care what my husband say. It's real funny. And, and, and it's funny to you and your girlfriends. But you ain't going to get married. And so eventually when they all gone and got their spouse, it ain't going to be funny anymore that you got this rebellious attitude that you're, you, that you're bragging on the fact that I'm not going to be a submissive wife. That's, that's totally against the character of God. That's totally against the word of God. And so there's nothing funny about it. You're laughing because there's a form of a, 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 a defense mechanism because you really don't know how to become that. So it's easier to make a joke about it than to become it. 
Thank you, Holy Spirit. But watch this. Watch this. So here's, and, and I, I was talking to this with my wife, and she's going to school for psychology and being a, a counselor. Here's what she exposed me to and, and began to explain. I want to explain the, the, from a psychological standpoint, I want to explain two words, repression and suppression. Repression and suppression. So repression is more subtle than denial. And you know what denial is. Denial is basically rejecting everything, okay? So when we look at repression, it's like denial, but it's not as intense. It's more subtle denial, just completely rejecting everything. Watch this. And it occurs when one has unacceptable ideas. Now, I'm trying to, this is known as a defense mechanism, but this is what the enemy can use against you to keep you from walking in the thing that God's ordained. So you deal with repression when you think that you have unacceptable ideas, feelings, impulses, or motives surface, and then automatically bans them from conscious awareness. In other words, this stuff uh, comes up, you start feeling some kind of way, and you automatically repress them. All right, so you don't have to deal with that because if I deal with it, it may eventually lead to me being rejected, okay? Either my ideas can be rejected, my feelings, my impulses, my motives uh, can, uh, can be rejected. So I, to, make, to keep them from coming to a, a place of conscious awareness, I, sup I, I repress them. Suppression is the avoidance, watch this, of uncomfortable issues or emotions. Watch this. Suppression is the avoidance of uncomfortable issues issues or emotions usually watch this guys usually the timing isn't right unfortunately many never find the right time so those issues and emotions are never dealt with in other words here's what happens um and here's here's the thing that i love as we're going over this god is helping us understand that no matter how much money i put in your hand no matter how big your house is no matter how much uh you pay for the car that you drive no matter how much your shoes cost you you're going to have to deal with people. And as long as you have to deal with people, you're going to now have to face how you respond to your interactions with people. And since we have to do that, watch this. I'm forced to have to interact with you. You're forced to have to interact with me. My heart is desperately wicked, and I need the Holy Spirit to pull everything in me that's not right. Your heart is desperately wicked, and you're seeing motivated as I'm seeing motivated, and we need the Holy Spirit to pull everything out of you. As we're interacting with each other, guess what's going to happen? There's going to be some type of clash with my sinful nature and your sinful nature that we need the divine nature of God to set both of us free. And my bank account can't get me from that. My bank account may cause me to move out your neighborhood, but it's going to be somebody in the next neighborhood with the same issue. My, my, my bank account may cause me to never have to talk to you again because I don't need you anymore. You're going to find the issue in somebody else. There are certain things you cannot escape, I cannot escape, and it doesn't matter how much is in your treasury. It doesn't matter your position. You're going to come in conflict with another human, and God is going to use that conflict to help you and I to see what we need to be delivered for, from so that we can help other people get delivered as well. Because if you're a first fruit offering, guess what? You got to go first. I got to go first. We got to deal with our own issues. We got to deal with the things that we need God to set us free from so that we can have dominion in the spirit because here's what's going to happen and here's what the Holy Spirit was showing me and here's what I want to motivate your heart. If you conquer this area right here, you're going to be, become a giant in the spirit realm and you're going to be amazed at the type of results that you begin to see. So you got to take this thing head on. You got to face it. You got to come against it. You got to gain authority in the spirit realm against the spirit of rejection, authority of the spirit realm against the spirit of rebellion and the root of bitterness. So let us continue looking at the root of bitterness. When we look at getting to the root, Matthew 3 and 10 says, even now the axe is put to the root, put to the root tree, the tree roots. Watch this. Therefore, every tree which does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. And that's what we got to do with everything that's not like God. The rejected, watch this, the rejected, therefore rebellious person often has a hard time forgiving. Watch this, guys. Have a hard time forgiving. Rejection hurts and it cuts and it creates offense which requires forgiveness. Now, here's the thing. 
The, now, most of the time, when somebody else have offended her, us, we focus on the person who does the offense and what is it they need to do to fix the situation. Here's what God is telling us right now as a form of, of deliverance and getting free. He says, now what needs to take place is the fact that you forgive. If there has been a, an offense created in your life that the, now the root of bitterness is trying to come in, here's how you fight against the root of bitterness. It's going to come through your forgiveness. You're going to have to forgive. And when we look at verse 24, the king says, I don't want him to see me. David is not at a place of forgiveness. So therefore, guess what's raining? Bitterness is still raining inside of David's heart. All right. Bitterness is raining. David is raining. But here's the thing that I need you to see. Because David has a prominent position and influence, he, there are things that he has to address what, whereby other people are choosing not to address. He's not confronting uh, Absalom on what he killed, killing Amnon, but he has to confront what's going on on the inside of him. I'm asking you to do it. I'm having to do it. As I'm seeing these different things, God is revealing to me that you got to move into this type of authority and you, you must come against what the enemy is trying to do in, do in your life. So I'm going to give you real quick 12 different, 12 different characteristics of the root of bitterness. Anger. All right. If you have suppressed anger, there's anger in you. You feel angry when you get around a person or think about a certain situation. The root of bitterness is in your life. Unforgiveness, the inability to forgive. There's a, there's a characteristic that there is a root of bitterness. And there's a lot that can come with that. Maybe you have uh, remembrance. Uh, um, what what uh, Eckhart talks about, uh, rem spirit remembrance, that it ends up bringing back or rehashing past events. So it's hard for you to forgive because you keep rethinking about the offense. And so it's as if you're getting hurt all over again. Hatred. You just you just just hate somebody. You're dealing with um, the, the, the root of bitterness. Revenge. You have a desire to get back revenge on someone. You're dealing with the root of bitterness. Violence. You had a place that, that just through a normal conversation uh, and also connect the violence is arguing. It, uh, what should be a normal, normal conversation blows up. It's because somebody in that conversation is dealing with the root of bitterness. All right. You take wrath. All right. Connected to anger. You take wrath. Strife. Those are characteristics of, of, of the root of bitterness. Murder that eventually um, um, Absalom does with, with, with Amnon. You remember when Saul said that he would, he would smite David against the wall and he threw a javelin at him on two occasions? What was happening? Saul was wrestling with the, with the spirit of bitterness. Retaliation. You feel the need to get somebody back. You got to get them back. You want them to pay. That is the root of bitterness. Temper. You, your temper is, is, is unsubtle. You can be nice over here and patient over here with this person. But when it comes to this person, you have no patience for them. Your temper is flaring up all the time. That are characteristics of, of, of the um, root of bitterness. Contention. You unsettled when you're around somebody. You're uneasy. You're dealing with the root of bitterness. Now, there are more connected to this, but for the sake of time and what we're sharing today, I don't have time to go into those. But I want to give you kind of an outline that you can start working from, that you can start looking over your life. And, and all of this right now, I'm not asking you to look at nobody else but you. I'm not asking you to look down the street. I'm not asking you to look at your, your, the, your spouse. I'm not asking you to look at your, um, uh, uh, any other family members. Right now, I need you to evaluate self and say, okay, am I operating in the root of business? If I'm operating in the root of business, it's, it's, it's coming in through some type of rejection. And in order for me to, to come, overcome this, I have to move into forgiveness. So our prayer would be, Lord, grace me to forgive all those that I believe have done me wrong so that I do not carry the root of bitterness. I do not want the root of bitterness in my life because the root of bitterness will lead to rebellion and, I, and, and eventually I will rebel against you as my Lord and Savior. So I don't want to rebel against you and I'm asking you to pull this root of bitterness out of my heart. Now for somebody, it's going to be tremendously hard because you didn't never you never considered this and as I'm talking about this is irritating you that 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 I'm saying it is because that that demon is alive and well in your life okay and so you got to uproot it but it starts with forgiveness I'm not saying it's okay with what has been done to you what I am telling you is take responsibility for yourself take responsibility for your life your decision your personality and your authority in the spirit realm and you come against this demon right Watch this. Verse 25 says, but in all Israel, there was none, watch this, to be so much praised as Absalom for his beauty, 
Watch this. From the sole of his foot, even to the crown of his head, there was no blemish in him. So Absalom was considered a gorgeous, handsome guy. There was, there was nothing from, from the top of his head to the sole of his feet. There was no blemish in him. Watch this. And I, I, now I want you to keep that in mind. And when he pulled his head, watch this. It was at every year, it, year's end, that he pulled it. Pulled it, and other, and that, well, it means to weigh. It says, before the hair was heavy on him, therefore he pulled it. And he weighed the hair of his head at 200 shekels after the king's weight. So he had dreads, he had thick hair, and he was considered so beautiful. And he, it was long, pretty thick, even down to 200 shekels. And it says, and unto Absalom there was born three sons, one daughter, whose name was Tamar, and she was of a fair countenance. So even Absalom, when he has his own daughter, he names her after his sister. He cares so much about his sister that he renames his daughter after his sister that was uh, violated. Now, here's the thing. Every time he sees Tamar, every time he calls his daughter, watch this, he is rehashing what took place. I need you to see this. It says, so Absalom dwelt two years, watch this, in Jerusalem and saw not the king's faith. So he was already gone in Gershon for three. He's now back in Jerusalem and he is, is there for two years. So there's a total of five years since he has interacted with David. So watch this. He knows that David said, I don't want to see him. What, what is it? I want you to follow me. What's Absalom dealing with? He's dealing with rejection. So if he's dealing with rejection, guess what's also being fed? It's the root of bitterness. He's in Jerusalem, but the king don't want to see him. He's being rejected by his dad. Pastor, why is this so big? There's nobody else in Absalom's life rejecting him. We just read, and I love the Bible tells us how gorgeous of a man he was. So there's no women who's rejecting him. Matter of fact, he has four children. So there's some kind of, somebody is receiving him, enough for him to have four kids. Imagine everybody around you telling you how great you are. But the person who you want to hear from the most don't want to have anything to do with you. You're being rejected. You hurt. And now bitterness. The enemy is using that rejection in Absalom life to hold the door. Now watch this. He is already Feeling. So now we're looking at a total of seven years because you remember when Tamar is raped? Seven years don't went by. How do we know? Three years. Now we had another two, but he took two years in planning. So for seven years, since what happened to Tamar has went on, he feel, Absalom feels like David did not handle the situation right. So this root of bitterness has been building up for the last seven years. And here's what, the point that I want to make in you. Is the fact that now that thing can be going on in your life for so long that literally you do not have the slightest idea on how to get free. You can be ruled by this rule of business so much that it affects your whole life. It affects your relationship. It affects your personality. And there's things that you have adopted about, your, about yourself that you swore is you. But the truth of the matter, it is motivated by a demonic spirit. And if you were to get delivered, I promise you, your personality will shift. And some of you, you are afraid of that because you have you have wore your personality as a badge of honor, even if it's destructive. And so if God strips you of that, you really don't know who you are. You really wouldn't know who you are. But God is telling you today so he can set you free. Look at this. It says, so Absalom dwelt two years. Watch this with in Jerusalem without seeing the king's face. Verse 29. Therefore, Absalom sent for Joab. Look at this, guys, to have sent him to the king. But he would not come to him. And when he sent again the second time, he would not come. Look at this. You remember how long we talked about this, this, this rejection? Seven years. Bitterness, seven years. Now, Absalom is now in Jerusalem, guy. I want you, Jerusalem. I want you to see this. He calls for, for Joab to come. Joab don't come. He said, we'll go back and tell him again. He called for Joab the second time. Now, now, this is not texting. This is not a phone call. They have to send messengers. So now that person gets the message and have to go. So time is going. All right. And look what, look what Absalom does. It says, therefore, he said unto his servants. This is Absalom saying to his servants. Look at this. Therefore, he said unto his servants, see Joab's field is near mine. And he have, bar he have barley there. 
Go and set it on fire, and Absalom's servant set the field on fire. Look at this, guys. Look at this. The root of bitterness is ruling Absalom's life to the point that anybody that rejects him, he attacks. Joe, he's only in Jerusalem because Joab put a good word in, in for him, if you would. Now, we see that Joab uh, uh, went against the relationship that he had with David just to get uh, uh, Absalom back. Absalom is, is absolutely, watch this, guys, oblivious to that because he want what he want. Ah, somebody got it. Oh, that's manipulation. There you go. Because Absalom don't go and burn the field. What did he do? He gets the servants to do it. You see how this stuff is coming full circle. He doesn't do it himself. He gets the servants to do it. And so now he, look at this. Here's what's dirty. He, he burns this man's field because he didn't do what he wanted him to do. What, why? He feels rejected. He, and what was on the field? Barley. So he, now he's, make, he's messing with Joel's money. He don't care. He just want what he want. That's, his, that's what manipulate. And people do. People that are, are, are driven by the spirit of rejection. They want their way so bad that they can care less how it affects you. Here's the downside. They will do what they do. It affects you. And then all of a sudden, after the fact, they have an old, old moment. Here's how you know you are being ruled by a demonic spirit. Listen to me. When you respond before thinking, and it seems like you was not in your right mind until after the act is over, then you can see clearly. You respond, and now, watch this, the enemy leaves you to pick up the pieces, and now it dawns on you when it's time for you to reap corruption because you did out of your flesh. Now it dawns on you, I can't act like that. You could be right in the middle of a marriage. Your spouse already told you, you need to get this together, you need to get this together, you need to get this together. Y'all been having the same conversation about your ways for the last 10 years. But all of a sudden, one day, they say, you know what, I'm done. Now, they said they can't do it anymore, but, but this time, they're done sound different. They start packing up their clothes. They start heading out the house. Now, you feel rejected again. But here's the, here's the problem. You can't now talk them back into coming. Because the thing that has been ruling your life that you never dealt with is destroying your life in another area. And now you cannot hate that person for making a decision to say, I don't have enough strength to keep going. But here's typically what happens. The rejected person finds a way in their heart to now become bitter against the person that they drive away through their actions. This is amazing. So Absalom burns his man field. Verse 31 says, And then Joab arose and came to Absalom unto his house and said unto him, Wherefore have thy servants set my field on fire? Now here's the thing. Absalom burns his man field. He burns the field of the general of the army. Joab can fight. He, but he, Absalom can, didn't even think about the consequences. He just wanted what he wanted. Watch this. It says in Absalom... Answer Joab, look what he says, guys, in verse 32. Behold, I sent to thee, saying, come hither, that I, that I may send thee to the king to say, wherefore am I come from Gershon? It had been good for me to have been there still. In other words, I should stay where I was, the king wouldn't see me. Now, therefore, let me see the king's face, and if there be any iniquity in me, let him kill me. Look at this. He says, in other words, here's what Joab said. I called for you, you didn't come, so... This got your attention. Isn't that amazing? That this man was willing to set this man's stuff on fire, burn, mess with his money, burn his field down because he did not get the attention that he wanted. The root of bitterness reigning. Bitterness is reigning in David. Bitterness is reigning in Absalom. Watch this. And because of what Absalom did, bitterness can start reigning in Joab toward Absalom. See how serious his spirit is? And there's a bunch of people, every person, I would say every person that's watching me right now, in some form or fashion, you need to put the axe to the spirit, the root of bitterness. It will reign your life and destroy the stuff around you as it is destroying you. 
Watch verse 33. It says, so Joab came to the king and told him. And when he had called for Absalom, he came to the king and bowed himself on his face to the ground before the king. Here's the, here's the thing I need you to see. And the king kissed him. The king kissed Absalom. Here's the thing. David, we saw in verse 21 through 24, had bitterness toward Absalom. The Bible doesn't say what went on in David from the time of 24 to 33 that caused David to not only accept Absalom to come in front of him, but to kiss him. Here's what happened. We don't know what situation took place. David, remember what I told you, the only way you can get over the root of bitterness, you need to forgive. David forgiving Absalom does not mean that, mean that David was okay with him killing Amnon. Didn't mean that. What it meant was David wanted to be free. He needed to be free. But here's what I want to point out. What did Absalom do when he came to David? The Bible says he bowed himself to his, to, to his face. In other words, he's, he's acknowledging David is greater. He's making obeisance before David. It looks very humble, right? Here's the truth of the matter. On the outside, Absalom was submissive. But on the inside, he was far from it. Because it would seem as though, as we read verse 33, the relationship between Absalom and David is about to get better. But it's contrary to that. It's about to get worse. Here's the thing. Not because David is rejecting Absalom. He's causing pain to Absalom. It is because Absalom is not dealing with himself. And here's the point that I need you to see. When you deal with the root of bitterness, before you can help anybody else, you got to deal with you. If you operate in the, in, in, in the root of bitterness and another person even forgives you or, or walk in love towards you, look, here's what you're going to see. Absalom couldn't even receive the love of his father who was being forgiven because he didn't deal with his own issues on the inside. I harp so much about how well, and I love that the Bible tells us how gorgeous Absalom was because it's the very thing that God is trying to help us to see now. You can look great on the outside, but still be messed up on the inside. No matter how much you can dress the outside up, you can go and get plastic surgeries, you can go and get dental implants, you can get hair implants, you, you can go to Jenny Craig or whatever it is you want to do. You can look great on the outside. You can look so good, everybody look at you and say, oh, I don't see any blemish. But on the inside of your heart, you can be walking around with so much chaos, so much junk, so much filth, and it eventually show itself up. Let's deal with the thing on the inside. Let's start with the spirit of rejection. Let's come against the root of bitterness. Sometimes you don't even see that stuff until it's too late. You respond, you act out, and now the enemy walks away after they get through using your vessel and you have to pick up the pieces of the decision that you made. Absalom had this thing on him so much that Joab, the very person who got him back to Jerusalem, he could care less and burnt this man's field because he didn't respond to him. He felt rejected. And here's the thing I need you to see. Rejected people, if they're never healed, it's just a matter of time before they also accuse you of rejecting them. Just now, Joab didn't do anything malicious, but it didn't matter because Absalom perceived it to be malicious. Spirit, spirit of suspicion. Over this next season, guys, I'm going to try my best, and I need you to pray for me, pray for me, pray for my family. I'm going to come against these demons. You may get frustrated. You may get mad because you may be operating in this, or you may know someone that do. I'm not here to make friends. I'm here to move us into the thing that God has ordained. I'm not in here to get more views. I'm here to, to move into what God has ordained. If you find yourself being offended through any of these messages, just repent. Ask God to, to forgive you of allowing the enemy in your life and denounce whatever it is that we're discussing. I'm going to ask you to do that. I'm going to ask you to take authority. 
I'm going to ask you to fast. I'm going to ask you to pray. I'm going to ask you to renounce that thing. I'm going to ask you to grow in the spirit. I'm going to ask you to get stronger. I'm going to ask you to become a giant killer. And I'm going to ask you to be a first root offering for your people and help them get free too. But you cannot destroy what you have given place to. Come against the enemy. Don't let them rule and walk in the authority that God has ordained. If you're wrestling with the spirit of bitterness and the root of bitterness, let's come against that today. If you're walking in the spirit of rejection, let's come against that today. If you're walking in the spirit of rebellion, let's come against that today. If you're walking in and, and giving way to the spirit of manipulation, let's come against that today. The Heavenly Father, I thank you by your grace as I lift up your people. I thank you that you are magnificent, you're great and mighty, and you're able to do a seed and a bundle above all that we can actually think by the power of God that worketh in us. Father, I thank you now in the name of Jesus that the spirit of rejection is a doorway demon. And we come against the spirit of rejection over the lives of your people right now. Every negative seed that has been sown for rejection to have dominion over their life, I command now, over our lives, I command now that it no longer has authority. I come against it in the name of Jesus. I open that our, I pray that our heart will be open, that we will see the areas in our lives that, re, that the spirit of rejection is causing havoc. Lord, I believe that by your grace that the spirit of rejection is an ushering demon. It is a doorkeeper. It holds the door open in our lives for other spirits to come in. And one of those demons is the spirit of manipulation. Manipulation is selfish. Manipulation is lustful. Manipulation wants what they want at all costs. Even if, they, uh, even if the, um, the Christian has to lie to get their way. But Father, I break that yoke of bondage right now. I come against in the name of Jesus every manipulating idea, every manipulating conversation, every manipulating motive right now that it no longer reigns in the name of Jesus. Father God, I thank you that, that you're showing us that the root of bitterness also is accompanied by rebellion. I pray against the spirit of rebellion right now. Every, every rebellious nature that, that, that calls us to rebel against your will and rebel against your word, rebel against the delegated authority in our life, I come against it in the name of Jesus. I come against the rebelliousness of, of children against parents, spiritual children against spiritual parents. I thank you, Lord God, I come against spirit of rebellion against husbands and wives and the mar marital relationships I destroy right now. Father God, I thank you by your grace that, that we are to submit ourselves under your perfect will right now and the delegated authority you place in our life. And ultimately you, Lord God, that your will shall reign above our own feelings and desires. That whatever your perfect will is, I pray now that we walk therein. Father God, I come against the root of bitterness right now. And Father God, I come against every, every seed that is manifesting through anger, unforgiveness, hatred, revenge, violence, Arguing, wrath, strife, murder, retaliation, temper, contention. I come against it now in the name of Jesus. And Lord, you help us by your grace to see that we can come against this demon and it has to come through forgiveness. You are the ultimate forgiver. Lord Jesus, you gave us the answer to how we fight against this spirit. That while you was being crucified, you said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. The only way you could have declared such a thing, you had already forgiven them. And you pray for their forgiveness. Father God, we pray that you will forgive us for every action that we have done, everything, that, every uh, uh, motivation that we've carried, every conversation that we've had that was rooted and motivated through the spirit of rejection, spirit of manipulation, spirit of rebellion, and the root of bitterness. We renounce those things out of our lives right now in the name of Jesus. And we open ourselves to the personality that you want us to have, not the personality that's motivated by demonic activity. And Father, I thank you, Lord God, for the grace to forgive. Every offense we surrender to you, we let it go now, that it has no place or authority in our life, and the root of business shall no longer reign, and every fruit thereof shall no longer have its way. But we shall walk according to your domain and be the men and women of God that you've called us to be. Father, I thank you that you will raise up men and women that won't break rank. May you take prayer lives to another level right now as you are answering what has been the problem. I pray, Father God, that illumination and revelation according to your will will be given to your people as this demonic influence removed out of our hearts. I thank you that we will have greater insight into your promise, and I thank you that your men and women shall walk worthy of the first fruit offering assignment and break every generation of curse right now. We thank you for your grace. Lord, we thank you for your power. 
And we give you the glory. We give you honor. We give you praise. I thank God for you. I bless God for you. I pray that you walk in the domain that he has ordained for you. Continue to pray for us as we continue to pray for you. And if those of you who are interested in becoming a part of the hand of the Lord, I ask that you go to www.thehand.us, hit on connect, contact us, I'm sorry, and then you, you can fill out that form and say, hey, God has spoke to our heart. We want to be a part of the hand of the Lord, and we want to be uh, uh, covered by the hand of the Lord. And we pray that as God has, has ministered to you to do so, you will get a phone call. We will contact you, get you started with our virtual New Vessel class. But we do have preparations, guys, to, to open very soon. So pray that those things come together and that the Spirit of God will have his way until we meet again. May God bless you and enrich you and empower you in Jesus' name.